Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast brought to you by Compliance Week and Cork. I'm Dave Leefort with Compliance Week, and I'll be your host. Today's webcast is titled Cutting Through Content Complexity to Create a Culture of Compliance. That's a lot of, a lot of alliteration there. Uh, before we re hear from our presenters, I'll quickly review the agenda. Uh, we are scheduled to go for one hour today. After the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, you can submit your questions at any time using the Ask a Question function on the left-hand side of your screen. We will have a short Q&A session with our guests at the end of the presentation. At the end of the q and I'll wrap up the webcast. On the left-hand side of your screen, there will be a drop-down menu where you'll be able to download our feedback form for the webcast. We welcome your thoughts as we're always looking to improve the user experience. There's also a help button located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen uh, if you need assistance during the webcast. Please also note that this webcast will not be offering CPE credit, so there will, be not, will there not be an exam at the end of the presentation today. Uh, on to our presenters. I'd like to welcome today's speakers. It is my pleasure to introduce Emerson Welch, Quark's Vice President of Marketing. Uh, Emerson is responsible for driving Quark's marketing strategies to, to support business growth. He'll be monitoring, moderating today's fireside chat. We also have with us uh, Kathleen Pierce, a principal analyst at Forrester, specializing in content operations and strategy. In her most recent role, she transformed the content ecosystem over 14 years, building up multiple content functions for marketing, sales, R&D, and customer experience. Lastly, I'd like to wel welcome Gareth Oakes, Chief Product Officer at GPSL, a provider of structured content solutions across a range of industries, including legislative, regulatory, and government publishers. GPSL has been active for 15 years with a team spread across four continents and seven countries. It is great to have you with us today. And with that, I will turn things over to Emerson to get us started. Thank you, Dave, for that very warm welcome. And hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, hello, Kathleen. Hello, Gareth. Wonderful to see you. And you. Hi, Emerson. Hi, Gareth. Right, so um, let's get started, shall we? Let's get talking. So I think the, the first question we'd like to start with, uh, uh, Kathleen, I'm going to start with you on mm -hmm. this one, is um, talking about compliance. What is the first step? organizations should take to begin practicing a culture of compliance? Two things. First is define your goals. And the second is know what the law is. So defining your goals, you need to have a centralized, a tiered risk model to prioritize what really matters because you want to match the level of rigor to the level of risk. So what compliance violations are going to lead to injury or death? Which ones are going to lead to major fines or inability to sell? That's where you need to focus your number one priority. Number two priorities are elements that hurt cost, customer errors, returns, customer satisfaction. And a rather distant three is things like phrasing and low or no consequence errors. Don't waste top heavy processes on trivialities. And the second is know what the law is. Because here's the thing, compliance is ultimately done by people. And it's very human, very common for people to come into compliance and dictate a particular approach, a particular process, because it worked at their last company. And compliance is a very heavy stick. Regulations are usually designed to be a little bit flexible you know, do what you say, say what you're going to do, and then do what you say. And so you always have to balance running the business with following regulations, and your touchstone should be the actual regulations. Yeah, it's a great answer. Gareth, uh, what would you think on that? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I love the way that Kathleen put it. Um, I've, we've seen as well that there's some, uh, and I guess you, you allude to this as well, there's some interaction between the regulators and the people who are in that sort of compliance regime as well. So I was sort of um, curious, I was thinking actually about how that plays out in practice. You know, we've um, dealt with some of the electrical industry out here, for example, um, and I know there's, um, you know, state by state variations as it were. And so a lot of mm -hmm. what you were saying before was making me wonder, how does that apply? You know, you say, what is the law? Well, that becomes a very tricky question when you consider, you know, federal law, state law, the certain regulators and agencies that exist within these jurisdictions, uh, and then the sort of the way things are done in that industry where 
I guess over you know decades, some of these uh, way mm-hmm. these practices have been figured out what they should look like. So um, I guess I, I like what you were saying with the fact that you, you can have a framework, but you have to adjust that to that specific industry mm-hmm. or that uh, domain within which you're working. Um, so yeah, I think that's that was really interesting from my perspective. Mm-hmm. One of the outputs of that that I've seen that works well is suppose that you are working in multiple geographies that each have different regulatory domains. That's where a level of content sophistication like dynamic reusable content comes in because then you can have boilerplate content for different laws and regulations and have it plug in automatically. But then there's yeah. – it's it's kind of a misunderstanding to think that the law is like – one size fits all, that it's completely unambiguous. Some things are, but other things other things need to be a little bit interpreted. And I've definitely been in the situation as a content operations leader dealing with, you know, three or four different people all in the regulatory groups who each told me, this is the law, all caps, and each of them is telling me something different. I'm like... <laughs> You can't all be right, you know. So clearly, <laughs> there's a little interpretation, and you have to be be savvy about and always keep safety. Of course, the key, the top of the pyramid, has to be the top priority, but also keep running the business in mind. Right, right, yeah. And there is some, you know, an extra challenge to remind me of there around creating that cultural compliance is when you've got those different geographies, you know. So we like to think just state yeah. by state or something like that, but you know, it's one thing to deal with, say, US and Canada and perhaps Mexico, but then you spread your wings over to Europe, perhaps Africa, Asia, and many different ways yeah. of doing business, many different regulatory regimes. And I think that's mm-hmm. where you would hit the challenge. We've seen that with some of our uh, larger clients where they're selling to all these different mm-hmm. geographies, whether it's uh, mining equipment, agricultural equipment, something like that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's um, we, we haven't seen the depth of where their compliance teams get to, but we've seen the end result because we get involved in the content systems and it, is, uh, it must be quite frightening <laughs> to, uh, yeah, from a cultural perspective, get everyone on the same page because you've got someone in Korea working with someone in India who's working with someone in the US. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like you say, everyone thinks they know what the law is and the way we do things. Um, so that's, that's right. I guess, one of the other key things to keep in mind if you are across all these geographies, uh, make sure you coordinate mm-hmm. effectively. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, when when working with organisations, I mean, we talk about challenges, we talk about content ecosystems, but Gareth, what what do you see as the biggest technology challenge they face across the content ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great place to go next. And, um, you know, maybe I'll start answering that question with the example, going from where we just talked about the different regimes uh, or jurisdictions, as it were, is you've got language barriers, that's something I think everyone can understand, right? So you're selling into all these different markets, you might have 30 or 40 different languages to support. Um, and then you go ahead and look at your systems for creating that content and how are you doing that? So some people today, if they're in an early uh, level of maturity, would create, say, an English document or a German document, wherever their home base of operations is. And then they've got to pay all this money to get translated <clears throat> to all those different regional uh, variations. And it's one thing to go into French, but then you've got Canadian French, you know? So there's all these different variations of language that come into play. And then worse still is, okay, we're selling into France. Well, they've got this way of doing things and that compliance regime that we need to comply with. And then we're doing the same thing over in Canada, but that's a whole different kettle of fish, right? And then we're doing US and that's fine because English and we understand it. But then we go to the UK and they still speak the same language, but the way they do things there is slightly different. Um, so I think, you know, to come back to that question, starting with that problem statement is, I believe a lot of the problem is these outdated and sort of unsuitable systems that exist. So everyone starts with, you know, what's the first thing we do? Let's just quickly bang it out in a Word document or something, and then we'll, we'll pay someone a whole bunch of money to translate it. But then the problem comes back. It's like, oh, now we've got to update it because it's a new version of the product or whatever we're working on. And now we've got to go and pay for all that retranslation. And then now there's all these different regional variations. So we've got to remember that this bit's slightly different in that country and that bit's slightly different there. And now we're managing this whole web of interconnected content now, without the correct systems in place, and we see this a lot, you know, people are literally having hundreds of spreadsheets to track everything. And they have to remember you've got a team of people on this geography and another team of people on that geography, or might be by product line, whatever it is, you've got teams of people who are specialising in just the managing of that content. How, how does it relate to each other? When I update something here, what does it do over there? Um, remember back to what Kathleen said about the regulatory culture, you know, how, how does that whole thing apply? Um, 
So I think if you are using basic tools like your Word, your Excel, all the common office tools, you're probably missing a trick. And I see that in a lot of organisations where you just basically paper over the cracks with people and process and it adds a lot of cost, complexity, um, lack of efficiency, turnaround time, all those sort of problems come into play. So if I was going to look at an organisation today, I would ask a lot of questions around um, you know, how you're doing mm -hmm. that sort of thing today, how you're managing this complexity in those different related bits of content and what tools and processes are in place because there's often a, a lot of ground to be gained there by just planning and organising yourself better um, starting from that uh, system perspective. Mm -hmm. I completely you agree. Like that, um, Kathleen? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And this is a great a great oh. time to think about your internal groups and always look inside before going outside. One mistake I've seen a number of companies make is that they realize that these cracks are turning more into regulatory abysses, and they bring in oh. some external consultant. And the consultant does something that is more or less good. But what really works is, in fact, investing in your content engine, because this is a tide that lifts all boats. The kind of infrastructure you bring in that creates content reuse, content compliance, multilingual uh, speed and agility, personalization, the investments you make in the people and the technology, it improves your customer experience, your employee experience, your efficiency, your speed, your com all of it. And so you need to build up that content engine and that will have improvements across the board, including but not at all limited to compliance. So this is a great time to look at your internal people who've been advocating for more investment in those fundamental um, enterprise content engines. Yeah, I think that pays off. In, mm, I think that pays off in another area as well, which you touched on, Catherine, which I wanted to expand on, was the delivery side. So traditionally, we would uh, see people delivering like PDF or some basic mm -hmm. web or even a CD-ROM back in the day. Um, but nowadays, we've got so much demand coming from all different angles. You know, people want the phone app, or they want a natural language query, or they want a VR or an AR experience. And I think we have to do what you say, Catherine, is organise ourselves. So not only are we more efficient about the creating the compliance content, be able to track it back and everything, but also be able to support these new digital experiences and ways of working, um, some of which we know and some of which I think we only imagine at this stage. Um, so I think that's a really good point as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I really like the way you covered all of the technology implications. Right. One of the first things I would do is just integrate my PIM, my product information management, talk about low hanging fruit, make sure that your people aren't having to look up specs, that you have a single source of truth for your product information. You know, that's just something everyone should have checked off the list and it's all right. populating that information automatically everywhere. It's funny you say that. I, I, this reminds me of a furniture manufacturer uh, we dealt with up in um, Michigan many moons ago mm -hmm. now, but they had that exact problem where their product information systems and their technical publications or, you know, supporting materials, sales support materials, everything was separate. So you'd go and say to the guy in the manufacturing shop floor, how big is our desk? Well, that's, you know, 72 inches. It's like, okay, 72 inches. Uh, and then you go talk to the people who market it. They're like, oh, no, we market that as a 74-inch desk. You know, 74 is the standard size for this. And, and then you go to the designers. They're like, no, it's 72.27 inches. That's what we draw in our CAD program. <laughs> No one had the answer. No one knew how big the desk was. <laughs> it depends who you ask. And that's um, one that's just, product. Yeah. Right, just one product. And a simple example of that, you can imagine, you know, by the time you're adding colour codes and finishes and materials and all this stuff, uh -huh. it just becomes a nightmare to manage complexity. And they had teams yeah. of people doing this, this problem of tracking which product comes in, what configuration, which markets do we sell it in, and, you know, when we want to make a change in Canada, how does that affect our business in the US? Because the factory that services them is in the one location. They can only do certain things with colours there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, the, you know, time back to what we're looking at here is from their compliance aspect, which making desks and stuff wasn't quite as heavy duty as like, a, you know, manufacturing equipment and things like that. But they still had that aspect of having to have the information right and correct so the customer knew what they were getting, um, you know, when you're supporting them. The product specifications matched what was being sold mm -hmm. to them. Um, the supporting materials, whether it's maintenance procedures or things like that, matched. Um, and for them, that was a huge challenge. So um, I think mm -hmm. you're quite right. <laughs> in other words, we've seen this in practice. <laughs> oh, yes. 
Yeah. Excellent. I, I wanted to sort of jump back to some of the, the key roles, really, that um, organisations need. So, when um, Kathleen, when you're implementing compliance across the business, what are the key roles, do you see? Mm -hmm. Well, first, you've got that regulatory leader who is defining the risk levels and should be really a cheerleader, building enthusiasm for the for the organization reaching those compliance goals. But even that is a, not quite as simple as it seems because there's regulatory, there's medical affairs, there's quality, you know, there's doc control within quality, even within regulatory. So, the, but whoever they are or whatever triumvirate they come up with, the best ones are deeply committed to creating a compliant business that is also effective and efficient. But then, over on the content side, there are a few new roles you need. So the first thing to realize is you've got to invest in content operations, whatever you call call it. These are the roles that are not writers. These are people who treat content as data. And it's analogous to, you know, when you're working with IT, you need people in IT, business analysts who know how to talk to the business. And in the business, you need analysts who know how to talk to IT. It's the same thing with regulatory, because you need people, trainers and editors within content operations, within the different uh, teams who know how to talk to regulatory. You need information architects and content engineers who set up the systems so that they work and they stay compliant. And you need trainers and digital asset librarians to make sure that all of the people who are executing have continual uh, reinforcement and checks so that they're right. And then as Gareth was pointing out earlier, localization managers are also part of this. Compliance does not get easier when you're doing it in 12 languages. Yeah, that's back to your point, Gareth, isn't it, really? Um, anything to yeah, add on that? I, I, I love the idea of calling it content operations. That really does wrap up a lot of what we're looking at here, like those main roles that support that. Um, hadn't really thought of it that way before, but you're quite right. You know, uh, the idea of having those librarians working with the architects, with the content engineers, and everyone who's mm -hmm. pulling that together as a system it makes a lot of sense. I think that's a more mature way of thinking about it than I've seen in a lot of organisations who tend to think, you know, that's just someone writes some content there and, oh, God, yeah, we need to organise it, I suppose, over here. And now we have to localise it and it's very disjoint unless you consider it as mm -hmm. a base of operations, like you just suggested. So I think that... Content is data. Yeah, content is data right. and it generates data. Forrester came out mm -hmm. with the idea of content operations back at least in 2013. And so I increasingly talk to a lot of clients who have a content operations function. And it's a very good investment because you'll always have many different groups creating content. That will never change. And the content operations, it's kind of like IT or HR. It's a group of people or regulatory a group of people with specific domain skills and knowledge that help all the other groups work in their necessary silos. Silos are bad, but on the other hand, functions are not bad. Right. And so you've got to have someone who just enables everyone else to work without having to reinvent the wheel in every place. And would you see that in practice, including, I'm assuming it would, some sort of feedback loop, not internally, obviously, mm -hmm. but externally, as you send this content to market and gather feedback, does that go back through the content operations function as well? Yes. In fact, I have one of my models is the idea of these two spheres. So within, say, a campaign or a launch, you have people who are working on the personas, the content strategy, the regulatory needs for that thing, and they're assessing the success of that campaign, that product, and that's going back into the way they work. But then you need this external right. sphere of the people in brand, in content operations, um, digital, who are defining the environment that they all work within. And so they're taking all of the performance data and efficiency data and all the rest from every launch and every campaign and using it to optimize the overall system. And right. generally That's the true. same people don't do both. You know, they, they can, the skills are similar, but you really need distinct functions because one is much more infrastructure, everybody, scalability, and the other one is we have to hit this particular sales goal in Nigeria. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that, that's um, another, 
you made me uh, think of another thing. I had a conversation just last week on this topic, actually. Uh, it's very related to this. So I was at an organisation who develops standards materials, and historically that is a, a ring binder or a PDF or something gets sent out. <laughs> oh, yes. And then maybe yeah. sometime in the future, ring up saying, was that any good? Did you like it? Uh, whereas now with the digital technologies we're starting to see today, you can have this much more closed feedback loop. You know, so a lot mm -hmm. of what you were saying, I think people would assume you had to do manually. Well, nowadays, I think technology is getting mm -hmm. to the point where you can send not just a PDF, but an actual link to a digital experience where if it's a standards mm -hmm. product, for example, you know, maybe it's an electrician's handbook type of thing. You can send that out now as a digital experience. They can work their way through mm -hmm. it, use it day to day. After a few months, you can gather that data, the analytics back and say, mm -hmm. oh, these are the bits that they're using all the time. We should spend more time making these bits good. These bits mm -hmm. weren't so good or they had, we can see they had trouble navigating here. Maybe we need to rework the structure of that content. I think we get the idea, but I, I think we're at the point now where some of what you're saying doesn't have to be a manual feedback loop anymore. We can automate and bring a lot of analytics back in and help us get much, much better at that sort of organisation. Absolutely. So, and yeah. it's like you said, when you start tracing out just one desk, one measurement is chaos. And you multiply that. You just see that mm -hmm. if people are trying to work in in any kind of standard, what I call a flat content tool where nothing's linked, it's just dumb right. content, it's, it's completely impossible. There's just simply yeah. no way. You have got to start treating content as data or you're going right. to fail. And you, if you're in a regulated market, you're likely to fail really catastrophically and all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's it's funny when you say about the flattening down. Yeah, this is another discussion we had with that same organisation a few months ago where we went with some ideas for how to could, um, I guess, structure their content in a more accessible fashion. Mm -hmm. um, the pushback from the experts was, you're dumbing down mm -hmm. what should be a technically correct. And, and uh -huh. so I'm not saying that right or wrong, but the feedback there, the instant reaction is once you simplify something, well, you're taking all the craft out of this. You know, you're making it too, sim too simplistic. It's over, it's dumbed down. It's going mm -hmm. to cause risk to people who are meant to be doing a very specific, mm -hmm. complex technical job. Um, I would actually argue in return that what we're trying to do is make it that people who are doing this job can do it in a more repeatable and less error-prone fashion because we're making the information mm -hmm. more accessible. It's much more clear in their heads what they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it, and how other people normally do this, You know, whether we're using illustrations or animations mm -hmm. or whatever it is to, to just show how this could be done um, Anyway, I just thought it's an interesting sort of little anecdote there that what we see when we try and apply some of this stuff is people will push back. Um, and and not with bad reason. Yeah, that's a fair yeah. it's a fair comment. You know, let's not make this a risk mm -hmm. to anyone. Obviously, let's like you said, I think right at the start, that's top of mind. The risk profile is what we're trying to reduce here. Let's keep the quality up, risk down. Mm -hmm. uh, but I believe that simplifying is not the same as dumbing down. I think we can have a definitely not. Too, from that perspective. But you know, that example that you just gave reminds me of one of the things back when I was a practitioner, one of the accomplishments that I was most proud of that my team came up with was working with, say, Japan, where they wanted a lot more detail. And then the US where their idea is anything that's longer than a checklist is a waste of words. <laughs> and so they developed uh, they developed a conditional text in their in their componentized CMS so that when you created your dynamic user guide, you could literally select the level of detail. So you could say, check, I want a, I want a checklist. I want the full detail with all the illustrations and all of the tips. Or even, and there was even an intermediate level. And I thought that was brilliant because as you say, it's not bad, it's not bad to want simple, it's not bad to want detail. The problem is if yeah. you have if you want one and you're getting the other. Right. Yeah, but and there's that's a, a need that's for a fair both. Point. So maybe you're an apprentice starting out, you need all the details you can work your way yeah. through until you're familiar, and then you can string mm -hmm. that down and just give me the checklist because mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> I just don't want to forget yeah. a step. <laughs> Right. Um, we've seen that same model applied um, in educational as well. So, yeah, trainer guide versus student uh, handbook type of thing where it will filter the content in and out. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that would apply in a regulatory terrain as well where oftentimes we think of the training materials as something separate. Perhaps if mm -hmm. they're considered as part of the planning of the core content, then you could apply this filtering idea to help you create one set of content that can feed all the different use cases as well. There's a lot of shared information there. You know, and right. shared information and shared wording can be different between tra training and content. But then when you're looking at documentation and online assistance and, you know, embedded assistance, all the rest and training, it's a very fuzzy border. So, yeah, I love right. I, I think 
all the smart kids are doing it that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, when, when you um, talk about technology as well, coming to you, Gareth, on this one, I mean, operating in highly regulated industries, what's the first area that they should consider to, to actually leverage technologies to ensure that their content meets compliance requirements? Where, where do they start with the technology, do you see? Yeah, um, I think I would start with, again, with those systems. So, you know, you asked me about the technology aspect. I think when you're looking at, uh, you know, what Kathleen alluded to, the outcomes, the goals of what we're trying to do here, and then you track back from there, you might say, okay, we want to have a really great um, compliance regime. We've got high quality content that people can use. But what we might find when we look at it is, okay, that high quality content is just a PDF page and it's hard to update effectively. Uh, we don't know if people got the right version in effect because they're pretty good out taking it in the field. Um, so <clears throat> we might want to trace back from there and say, okay, if we look backwards, where does this start? Well, the problem is we had people creating work documents and they hit print and that made the PDF and we gave it to people. And that seemed simply convenient. But what we did in practice is that the 10 or 12 people that created that content got the benefit of just writing something easily and hitting okay. But the thousands of people using that content now are having the problem of, uh, we don't know if we've got the right version. Uh, it's hard to navigate. Some of the cool stuff Kathleen just talked about where we want to navigate uh, content that's data mm -hmm. isn't there, so we can't deal with it that way without our other systems we work with. So I think I'd look very carefully at, as a starting point is what, what are the tools and processes that I can put in place that help me create intelligent content? So not just you know a, a one and done item that I've said to print out as a PDF, but how do I make this as, uh, I love Kathleen's word, content operations, right? So how can I create this part of a content operations um, model in my business where my content's now being created out of intelligent tools, um, you know, mm -hmm. let's say structured content, which is a standard practice in this area, mm -hmm. um, where we've got our content now modularized so it's reusable, it's easily translatable to different languages. We can link it to direct bits of legislation or regulation so we can control mm -hmm. our auditability. And then the benefit of doing this all properly is we can now hit OK and not just make a PDF, but all those rich digital, digital experiences. We can integrate with other business systems. Um, you know, you get the idea, but having that intelligent content, we have so many different doors open to us as well as mm -hmm. being more efficient. So it's sort of a win-win. I guess yeah. the flip side would be it is a significant investment and we want to have the people who know what they're doing involved. We need the experts. So there's going to be a bit of organisation and planning. But I believe because that, that problem I said before is you're saving 10 people work with the other way, is we want to save the thousands of people mm -hmm. to work and make everything much more better. The 10 people, we might have to spend a bit more money giving them the tools and technologies they need to be successful, a bit of training, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But once they're up and running and have that content operations mindset in place, I think we'll see that becomes quite a repeatable process. And better yet, those thousands of downstream consumers um, all benefit from a much richer content experience. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's quite a long-winded way of answering it, but that's kind of what comes to mind. That's where I'd want to start mm -hmm. um, with such an organisation. I don't know if you agree, yeah. Kathleen, or obviously. Absolutely. I call that the content engineering curve. And so if you imagine your standard Cartesian right. graph, then it's always, you know, with effort on the vertical and number of pieces of, of content on the horizontal, on the x-axis, it's always very, very low effort to create one or two or 10 pieces of content. But then the more you create, it goes up asymptotically. Right. Whereas right, with right. intelligent content, which is a wonderful thing to Google, by the way, the effort is higher at the start, but then it drops and then it goes out literally into the millions. And, you know, with, with periodic little bumps for refactoring and, and maturing your system, it goes and it drops to a very manageable level so that you can scale and get take advantage of combinatorics to get almost infinite personalization once you've made the investment mm. in a great content engine. But the challenge is that hump so, that it's always easier for a person to create one piece of content manually. Right. So maybe the thing to look out for is that crossover point early on and say, wow, this is getting really tough really quickly. <laughs> we need to mm -hmm. go back and plan and organize ourselves a bit better with our tools and processes here. That's right. We've definitely seen what you say play out in practice you know, a number of places. Uh -huh. um, I think Boeing's a great example of a study. They've done so much in this area um, mm -hmm. where, you know, like you say, to begin with, I think that people, even on typewriters, you know, banging out all the documentation <laughs> for the airplanes. But their business oh, status yeah. such that they're creating so many different types of airframes um, that mm -hmm. that typewriter approach just 
can't scale anymore. Um, and we, mm -hmm. I was involved with some projects in the um, late nineties where they were um, rapidly mm -hmm. modernizing that part of the business and producing because profit mm -hmm. damage, obviously you want to get changes out as quickly as possible. If there's any fault found, you gotta get right on top uh -huh. of it <laughs> before the regulators yeah. spot it. Right. And you've got to be very proactive in that process and you can't rely on people sitting in a corner of a room with a typewriter anymore. So you tend to organize your systems, get your content mm -hmm. in as data, have it all correctly tagged and labeled so it can be found mm -hmm. and managed. Um, have the correct content, they, they didn't call it that, but the content operations processes in place mm -hmm. where you're able to automatically mm -hmm. uh, produce it as well as update it and track all the usage of it and get that out to market. So, uh, Yeah, the yeah, airlines again, were fantastic. Saying, I agree. <laughs> no, they, yeah, they, they were real uh, leaders in simplified English and Boeing was absolutely a leader. I was actually in school at the University of Washington back in the early 90s and did some of some of my classwork with Boeing talking about natural language processing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, simplified technical English seems like a really great idea and we've um, been involved in a few projects that make use of that. It's another one of those ones where you have to put a bit of work in up front to put the right tools in place because no one wants to be referring to that big Bible <laughs> publication they have on STE. But um, I think right. the benefits, it's, it's, it's again that you do that bit of work up front that the benefits apply all the downstream because um, mm -hmm. You know, just for those who maybe are listening to this who haven't come across that before, you've got the problem with people like mm -hmm. Boeing where these planes are flying all over the place. They're going to be maintained in Berlin. They're going to be maintained in New York. They're going to be maintained in Delhi, in Beijing, you know, wherever they happen to be, wherever that maintenance base is. And uh -huh. the problem you've got is you need that maintenance to be done exactly the same at each location. Otherwise, you mm -hmm. risk someone didn't talk that bolt up enough. And now the engine fell off, bad example, but you know, that's yeah. the point here. Everything has to be done perfectly. Yeah. And without the simplified technical English approach, you leave the language open to interpretation. So if you say to someone, twist the bolt, perhaps in their language, that twist had a slightly different meaning that you didn't even think about. So you use specifically mm -hmm. defined terms like rotate. And we only use that one verb for that one action and things like that. I think it's a really mm -hmm. good approach. And and I guess this is very relevant for the compliance thing. Is is yeah, thinking from that idea is what do we do with our language that we can help standardize or simplify? Again, mm -hmm. not for the dumbing down, but for the purposes of clarity and repeatability and all that sort of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, standardized language. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really cool. Yeah. I would definitely be looking at make seeing that I had some kind of authoring assistance, some kind of a tool for terminology management and eliminate unnecessary va variation. You know, turn on, power on. Why right. why pay twice? Yeah. Absolutely. I think um, that's all great stuff. And I think what I want to do now is I want to switch some gears because AI, hey, it's it's right out there at the moment. Everybody's talking about it. And we, we need to talk about this because it's so important. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen, I'm, I'm going to start with you on this one. What should mm -hmm. organizations do to prepare mm -hmm. themselves and prepare their people to use AI effectively? Mm -hmm. I'd say first, don't do it because it's cool. Do it for a reason and be very clear about what that reason is and how you're going to measure it. There are some really exciting things going on. I love the ability of finally being able to scale. So often I've seen content groups say they create wonderful content for three scenarios and the sale, the sellers and the buyers say, do this for everything. And the content people say, yeah, if you give us a million monkeys, we can do that. And so now with AI, okay, it's it's okay. more possible. But man, I am really concerned about the inattention to the fundamental inattention to privacy issues that are in some popular AI tools. This is un, uncharted or semi-charted territory. And I would be very cognizant of privacy issues if I were implementing this in a regulated environment. And second, I would say be very wary of AI's ability to create credible but wrong content in huge amounts very quickly. Because what I see is we can't manage all of our human created content. So why do we think we're going to be able to help people find it when there is a jillion times more of it that's coming out of an AI firehose? It's, it reminds right. me of a lot of starting things where I've seen people react to early systems, like say, you know, a Dropbox and, and they're like, oh, you know, lovely, logical, clean in folder, you know, hierarchical infrastructure. We love it. It's so clean and neat. 
you wait a quarter or two and all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, we're drowning in here. We've got, you know, you know, 11,000 folders and 100,000 files and no one can find anything. And that happens fast. So with AI, there are some amazing, impl some amazing applications, but be very deliberate and really think through, game out the scenarios. <laughs> I think um, I think that second risky touch of Kathleen is the one that really keeps me up at night. Is you know we we might get to a point I can imagine pretty soon where people are like oh I'll just get AI to write me my latest compliance guide or whatever. And like you say, for anyone who just looks at it, they're like oh that looks great, thank you. We'll mm -hmm. just put that out there. But hidden in there is a, is some sort of time bomb or some sort of defect that you don't pick up until it's way too late. That that language right. could be interpreted a different way because we didn't spend the time to do that little bit of extra due diligence. We trusted the AI too much. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's just an algorithm running over some pre-existing data and it's going to generate whatever it thinks mm -hmm. sounds right according to an algorithm. But that's not done with any um, intellect, right, that we'd normally assume a human would do when they're compiling such things. So I think that's a really pernicious um, mm -hmm. problem that we're going to see come out. And I'm, and I'm sure we haven't seen the last of that particular mm -hmm. problem. Um, so that's, that's the one that really keeps me up at night. And then also one about the flip side of that, not only when we're generating something, but when we're interpreting something. So AI can be used uh -huh. to generate. But it also right. be used to interpret. So we might say um, to our mm -hmm. AI tool of the future, hey, can you um, tell me, given um, what just happened for this incident, uh, which compliance, uh, sorry, which regulations, which legislation do we need to be taking into consideration? And it might pick you out 10 things. And that's great. You go look at those 10 things and you think you're done. You miss number 11. And that's the one that the, the regulator is going to land on you for because your AI didn't think mm -hmm. about number 11, didn't pick up number 11, the keyword didn't match or whatever it was. I can't imagine. But that number mm -hmm. 11, again, it's the same sort of problem in reverse. Is it, we didn't generate mm -hmm. something wrong. We forgot to check the analytic tool, forgot to check something that it should have checked. Um, so right. I think that's that's the stuff that seems really um, likely to catch people out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I would also um, say... Having the, said that, I think there's a lot of promise. Oh, okay. um, uh -huh. If we can get yeah. over those humps, right? There's a lot of promise. Mm -hmm. A lot of <laughs> Sorry. promise. Oh no, it's super exciting. I'm I have um some of my of my co-researchers like Lisa Gately and Rowan Curran are doing amazing research and publishing about this. The potential for wonderful stuff is very exciting. And I would say that the temptation could be in a regulator regulated environment to just close the faucet and say, this is too risky, we're not doing it. And right. it reminds me of when when the translation engines, the online translation engines got reasonably good and then they got online. And what I saw was within companies, if you don't have some kind of compliant, trained, uh, accessible machine translation engine, if your people need something in another language, either to put it into another language or to understand, they will go use those free tools. I've seen finance departments translating letters and not realizing what open source means. Like all of a sudden your IP is not so not so private anymore. And so if we yeah. the, this change has been forced upon us and as right as people trying to get compliant at scale, we can't afford to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist because it will seep in under the doors all around as our people find that they need to use it to do their jobs. And so a smart company is going to put some resources on that pretty fast and figure out how to use it and where, you know, and pay attention to those top of the pyramid issues. Where do they really have to say, never, ever, ever do this, but don't try and control the bottom of the pyramid too much because it won't work. Yeah. 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 I think that's a really good point. You know, try as you might, you, you can't stop it. It's going to come. <laughs> so best to try and yeah. get ahead of things and, and work out. Get ahead of it. Of problems. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, from, from our point of view, we've seen a lot of benefits in workflow optimization as well and being able to, you know, to optimize and, and standardize in line with compliant processes and be able to use the benefits of AI to make sure that that content is moving in the right direction, it's being seen by the right people and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's 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 an additional benefit of AI outside of just the actual content that's being produced by it. I think, yeah, there's, there's mm -hmm. certain machine learning aspects as well that you can bring into it, which is which is really interesting for us. We're, we're certainly looking into that. Um, I mean, 
sticking with you, Kathleen, on this one, are there internal steps organizations should take to use AI to eliminate compliance risks? Is there, is there any way that you can actually use it to combat those risks? Mm -hmm. Well, I would I would remember that tiered risk model, and I would be very intentional about try if you're doing stuff that's a little experimental, try your AI on the low risk areas, or flipping it, use it in a very targeted way to reduce risk in the high consequence areas. So again, just being intentional about it. And really, so match the guardrails to the risk. And don't forget about risk in other languages. Because, you know, just remember, remember that if your employees don't have any compliant way to communicate in other languages, they use free tools and they will use AI. And if you can't read it, you can't understand your risk. So I would I would go into this, you know, like we're all we're all used to riding in horse-drawn carriages. All of a sudden, cars are on the road. You know, get in a car and start start exploring, but don't don't run off the road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, I think just uh, just one last question. I think Gareth, this is this is for you. This one. So, what is the biggest contributor to organizational failure? to meet compliance requirements after content is published. So if you think of it from that perspective, what do you think that is? Yeah, well, I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, to carry on the horse and cart uh, paradigm, the horse has bolted the gate by the time you publish. <laughs> so um, the contributor to that failure probably happened long before you published. Um, mm -hmm. And that would mm -hmm. be the fact that the information you produced just didn't suit uh, like we talked about this earlier, you know, you created something that was a, a, a PDF or something like that. It's a static content, but you mm -hmm. did it by force, as it were. You didn't use proper tools and processes. So you had some people work together. Maybe they used some of the free tools that Kathleen was just talking about, or they did their best job. Um, you, you didn't have, because you didn't have a correct system in place to manage the creation and uh, review and approval of that content, you know, it got through and it was okay. It looked okay. But when it got out there, it was, it was not 100% useful. And moreover, it's hard to update because it took such a monumental effort to get that thing made in the first place. It's going to be very hard to get that updated as well. So mm -hmm. the organisational failure, I guess, <clears throat> it was probably more due to the lack originally of the planning and coordination of those aspects we've already talked about, which is setting up the correct tools, the correct people, the processes that form. I love it again. I'm going to use it. Content operations, um, maturity for the business, right? <clears throat> and... I think if that could have been addressed, you know, in this example, we're looking at where something's been published and not quite right, then I think you've reduced the risk of publishing something that's not quite right because you've got these experts in place using efficient tools and technologies. We're not having a lot of extra quality check steps. We're not having a lot of problems mm -hmm. trying to figure out where your information is or should be because the system is managing all the references for us. It's managing the related language variants. It's managing uh, links into like legislation or regulation where the specific performance factors to take into account. And that means that instead of us having to um, feed the machine, as it were, it's sort of helping us just do our job more effectively, that we're able to get that content mm -hmm. written correctly. It's been reviewed and approved. We can track that back for auditability purposes. And once we publish, then it is something that can be out there as a, in many different ways, whether it's a PDF or a digital experience, mm -hmm. or mobile app or whatever it's feeding. Um, but better still, we can then go ahead and update that as well. So rather than it being a monumental mm -hmm. effort to produce an update, we've got this process where it's like, oh, we just realised this clause that we had was slightly wrong or needs to be updated for some change in the regulations instead of us having to go and rebuild the whole thing. We go back to the start, we look at that clause, it'll tell us any related things we need to look at while mm -hmm. we're updating it. We update those four things we found, we hit a button and now it goes out again fresh. So I think that would be mm -hmm. the, the flip side to the, the problematic organisation would be the effective organisation where that becomes just a standard process. It's not like we had to do something special or different or some monumental effort from a big specialty team we pulled together. It's just part of that content operation cycle where we're able to do quick updates, um, producing high quality content that's being used effectively. Ideally, I think we've got that feedback loop we talked about much earlier where now we're able to gather analytics or actual customer feedback items and bring them back into the process at the same time as well. Um, so we're being very close to our customers and very effective in managing their needs and demands. 
I feel like I might have gone a little bit of a tangent of your original question, uh, but that's certainly what comes to mind as to where organisations should be looking if they ha are having mm -hmm. those sort of problems. Um, yeah. Kathleen, does that, uh, does that spark yeah. any ideas or do you agree with any of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. When, when I saw that question, I was thinking, to my oh. mind, the biggest error is assuming that content doesn't need to change after the official version has been published. And you just did a great job of describing it. Right. But sometimes in marketing, we can be so enamored with our own models and our, our good understanding of things that we're not always willing to think about the fact that buyers and sellers often need to take bits from multiple places uh, regional marketing needs to make changes to make something locally appropriate. And we have a choice. We can either define our upstream systems so that those changes are just a matter of, you know, adapting something very easily, or if it requires rogue action, recreating stuff, you know, under the table. It reminds me of the early days of yeah. of when CRMs were were out and you know salesforce and we saw that people would often just go in and and customize stuff and they'd build more and more custom things to help them do stuff and then they ended up with a system that was so highly customized they couldn't upgrade they just painted themselves into a corner and now the systems mm -hmm. are designed with a ton of custom of configurability so you can configure what you need without having to customize the code and we need to treat our content engines the same way, expect the variation, plan ahead for those scenarios, and make it so that we've built compliance into the system so people can get in a state of flow where they're not having to think about compliance. It's just built into the way they work. That's a good compliance system. I like that idea of getting people into a state of flow, removing that friction, because there are, I've yeah. seen it so many times where it's, oh, I've got to go to this system now and try and pull something out. And mm. what you said about custom customization to the system, I think also applies to the content. We've seen examples, mm. and you may have seen this as well, mm -hmm. where if people can't get ready access to the information they need, like you said with the Google tools, they're going to go out and just do it. So they couldn't mm -hmm. find the bit they wanted for their marketing blurb. <clears throat> They'll just make it up because they've got to keep yeah. moving because it's almost five yeah. o'clock and I've got to get <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I've got a tender. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Whereas if, like you were saying, we had the system in place, it'd be like, you know what, I'll just query our system and say, can I have the marketing material mm -hmm. for this particular thing? Oh, here's one we did last week that someone else did. I forgot or didn't realise they'd done it. I could pick that up, reuse it mm -hmm. and send it out. And then, in fact, mm -hmm. it, it saved me time, it saved me effort, it saved me a compliance risk of making up something on the spot quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's the other way to look at it as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> one thing I've always found is a great way of future-proofing my systems is I go around and I talk to people around the company, all of the customer-facing people and the people in marketing, right. and I go out there with an amnesty. Anything you tell me will not get you in trouble. And I look at what are <laughs> they doing under the table? Where are right. the systems forcing them to kind of go underground and do stuff that's a little unofficial? Because that's where you're going to see the problems. And so you need to have a, a, a level of trust where your people can tell you that and then you redesign the systems so that it's easier for them. It's easy. Wow. In a good system, it should be easier to be compliant than to not be compliant. Yeah. I love that idea of asking what's happening under the table. Because <laughs> like you say, that, it's um, you know, like a pay yeah. the cow pass thing. It's like, where, where are you guys always having to, to work around our systems and why? Right. And we should understand right. that and make them better. It's not your fault. <laughs> no, yeah. no. Yeah. And even if it, even if you disagree, it as mark, mm -hmm. as we marketers love to say, perception is reality. And so if they feel they need to work around something, there's something real they're reacting to. Even if you disagree with the way they're doing it, there's a need there that you need to understand. Yep. And so that that is something I always keep an eye on in systems. My feeling is there's always some level of rogue behavior that's normal. It's a great source of ideas. If it's the way people work, if it's the way they're do, getting their jobs done, the more you have, the more of a red flag it is. Because I always say, Quota yeah, carrying yeah. sales reps, they're not creating content for fun. They're creating it to right. get quota. <laughs> and so that's yeah, a very yeah. serious, serious thing to pay attention to. Yeah, uh, that's wonderful advice, Kathleen. Thanks for sharing. 
That's great. Thanks, both. Um, I think we're going to uh, to, to take some Q and A now. Um, so, uh, Dave, I was wondering if you had, had some questions for us. Yeah, definitely. First off, I just want to say uh, what a fascinating conversation. As someone who uh, creates content for a living, these are these are questions that I and, and our team face every day. Particularly the the bit about AI uh, and the fact that we're sort of in in early days, as it being you know so public and so available for anyone to use, but the risk there, you're absolutely right. It, the risk is fully mature, and it's only and it's only growing as 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 sort of the uh, the use of AI grows. So I think um, w with that said, I'm going to to kick us off with a with a question on AI, um, and I'll I'll just throw this out to whoever wants to answer it. So uh, and it has to do with um, AI as a recognized persona. So the question specifically is. Will AI become a recognized persona in the content operations workflow? Well, Gareth, I'll ask you what you think, but my feeling is AI should become a recognized player in the content operations workflow. And, you know, I grew up on Asimov, on Donald Walheim, on Theodore Sturgeon. You know, I love classic sci fi. And so, frankly, I love the idea of having a robot friend to talk to. But my feeling is, until an AI is signing POs against their own wallet, they are not a target persona as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Uh, I kind of agree, and I, I think it's, um, who knows where we'll end up, right? But today I think we need to consider AI is more of a tool to assist us in our work, and we shouldn't, I, you know, we said this before earlier, but we shouldn't put too much trust in it just yet. Yeah, you know, let's understand what it's good at, what it isn't good at. Mm -hmm. It's a team player for us, mm -hmm. and like any team player, it has strengths and weaknesses, and we need to be fully aware. It's no magic wand that we tap on something to fix a problem, but it can definitely be a very helpful tool um, to help us do our jobs better. Um, and I think a persona maybe is not the right way to put it, but I think it will be a significant part of the you know, mm -hmm. content operations workflow going forwards. Mm -hmm. Like I said, from two aspects. One of them is to help us generate content. The second one is to help us research and analyze and understand mm -hmm. other content. I think it has a part to play mm -hmm. in both aspects. Yeah. <laughs> when I think of all the time I've spent in my career pivoting and using, you know, setting things up in Tableau and all that, and I think of AI doing, applying its brain that is better at that kind of pattern recognition and large scale data analysis. I'm like, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I can think of... Um... <laughs> we have to write another dashboard. <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, one, there's one area we're looking at, which is um, content search and discovery and findability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing that as a real opportunity to, to implement AI and to help you search your CCMS, mm -hmm. your repository, much faster to find content that sometimes might fall beneath the radar um, mm -hmm. or open your mind to potentially using something else in your content that you might not have thought about before because the AI is serving you some analytics on the success and the ROI of that content. So those, those for us are really exciting areas that we're investigating. Yeah, well, that, that does really help open your mind up, doesn't it, Emerson? You know, it's like the, the Amazon thing. You go to Amazon to look for a product and all of a sudden it's recommending these six other yeah. products you haven't thought of. Yeah. Content recommendations is a great example. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some some really great stuff. And, and you know, you, we could have entire series of webcasts just on AI in general. So it's it's definitely mm -hmm. something that's going to be top of mind for every organization. Um, I think we, we have time for one, one more question here. And it's... Uh, I'm going to bring it back to uh, to risk. And mm -hmm. so the question is, who should be the ultimate decision maker? So the ultimately be in charge of making sure that content stays compliant. Is that a marketing job? Is that a compliance uh, practitioner job? Is it head of risk? Is it IT? Is it, you know, any, any of the above? Does anyone want to tackle that? Gareth, do you want to go first this time? Uh, yeah. I'm thinking, because uh, we deal with a lot of different organisations, what the models we see for across, um, and it does depend on, I think we talked about this way earlier on, it does depend on which industry, which domain you're in as to where the risk falls, you know. Is it, mm -hmm. is it just that, you know, for, let's say, I'm manufacturing products, um, obviously, if I'm developing them for, for end users who are the public, maybe to buy them at Walmart or something like that, then I have a certain level of risk baked into that product I'm offering. If it's another type of risk, could be I'm, uh, I'm not 
building the end product, I'm just uh, part of a supply chain that's going into an end product. So my level of risk is slightly different and the degree to which that risk falls upon um, what I'm producing is slightly different. And in that case, I believe that would modify where the role sits. Obviously, all of it's going to come up to the CEO who holds the, the risk in general. But I think, you know, when you break it down, you say, okay, for the um, the manufacturing guy, you know, as the production manager uh, of that supply line probably holds a lot of um, risk at that level because they need to make sure that what they're producing is done the same every time. Um, it's meeting those specifications from the design team and so on and so forth. But as you can tell from the way I'm talking, the design team also has a certain level of responsibility to make sure the design is safe and compliant and, you know, fire uh, hazards are accounted for and things like that. Um, so I think it's it would be hard in a lot of organisations to pin one person as being the compliance person. Obviously, you want someone that you can go to that's the expert on the regulatory environment, the legislative environment, things like mm -hmm. that, that you can go and say, hey, how do we interpret this bit? But I think it would be um, a bit unfair to make that one person responsible for managing their compliance risk across every arm of the business. I think mm -hmm. you need to have probably that culture of compliance we talked about baked in where everyone feels part of it. They know where they can go to get the information they need. They know they're supported by the organisation. Um, I, I don't know, Kathleen, does that resonate with what you've seen as well? I mean, that's how we see it. Yeah. Play out. Yeah. And so I'd say the head of your regulatory quality medical affairs groups, they are they're responsible for defining the risk and for identifying right. the pertinent and tr even trade compliance, you know, is in there as well. You know, what are the risks? What are the requirements? And also they should be the ones keeping up both the back end analytics and a player's scoreboard to say, how well are we doing in our pursuit of compliance overall? You can you can err by giving the, com the regulatory groups too much control because I have seen in practice at multiple companies where you can end up with a lot of people applying a high level of scrutiny to trivial changes and they just – and sometimes the regulatory right. groups are not at all accountable to time to market. And so they just – they delay publication or production yeah. – just for an infinite series of pretty pretty subjective change requests, which are not in that top tier of the pyramid. They're more like, oh, we, I think we should say it like this. No, I think we should say it like this. And it's like the old thing where they want 19 iterations and finally you give them the original one. They're like, yeah, that's perfect. And that's that's bad. Right. That's not good. Right. Uh, but so there's clearly so a balance feel, in there somewhere, right? Because then you've got like Boeing seven three seven Max, where it's like we push this one out to market, maybe a little bit, and people <laughs> die. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you've got to have that very clear picture of matching matching the rigor to the risk, and being and eliminating as much friction as possible. So I feel like the regulatory leaders are the ones who carry the flag and and do the scoreboard and say, here's the goal we need to reach. And then the different groups, product development, digital, sales enablement, content, are all responsible for saying, okay, in my area, here's what I'm going to set up. Here's what, here are my compliance metrics. Here's the infrastructure I've developed to help us do it faster, better, hmm. you know, more right. multilingual. So they take more like a referee yeah. role. They're not the captain of the team. They're a referee that make sure we're yeah. playing nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because it's designing generally the stuff you do to achieve compliance. Frequently, it makes your operations and your business just better because a lot of it is just frankly good practice. So it's yeah. a great opportunity yeah. to combine it with a kind of general business process uh, o overhaul and mature mature everything. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort, um, but also don't forget the brand police as well. So the <laughs> content <laughs> can't go out the door with the brand police, the marketing department actually having some kind of sign off yeah. within that. I think um, obviously that resonates with me particularly, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, you can be the most compliant content from a regulation report uh, point of view, but if it doesn't represent the brand and it goes out with the wrong logo and the wrong font types and the wrong typeset colors and things like that, then obviously you've got a different kind of, of compliance problem. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. so but it is, 100% agree is definitely a collaborative team effort to make sure everything goes out mm -hmm. as it should be. Yeah. And in fact, listening to that, it reminds me of one one player that I don't think we've mentioned, but they're actually a big player, is your, your part number management. 
your your the groups who manage your bombs, your bills of material, um, your part numbering, because all of that infrastructure needs to be set up to say manage the fact that if you have one piece of content, whether it's a whole file or a component, and you've got you know seven different variations for different regulatory domains, and you've got it in ten different languages. That's really one piece of content with 17 layers of personalization. Right. Mm -hmm. And so your your part numbering systems and your all the different systems for regulating the way you manage information, that also needs to be optimized to deal with this kind of personalization. And we don't always think of that. That's... We don't usually think of supply chain as part of the way we do marketing, but it it actually is. Hmm. Yeah. That's that we do see a lot of um, issues with that out there. Yeah, we call it the product yeah. configuration matching to yeah. The, yeah. the, I guess, a technical publication configuration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, really good stuff. Really good stuff. Thank you. Thank you all. We are uh, just about out of time here. So um, I want to thank you, uh, Emerson. Thank you to Kathleen. Thank you to Gareth for uh, today's riveting conversation. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Quark for making this webcast possible. Uh, and with that, we will wrap things up and uh, we'll see everyone down the road. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.